The day had been a bloody one, Prince Bayezid thought, as he surveyed the fields of Kosovo. The dead were scattered throughout the plain, and both the Ottoman and Serbian forces had made significant contributions to that slaughter. But despite the heavy losses, Bayezid looked on with pride. The left wing of the Ottoman army, commanded by his brother, Yakub Salebi, had been pushed back, while the right, commanded by Bayezid himself, held firm and launched the counterattack that would ultimately rout the Serbs. As the prince was giving orders to his officers to start mopping up, he noticed a rider coming from the Ottoman center. Your father has been killed, the rider exclaimed, not even taking the time to dismount. Bayezid knew he had to act fast. He barked some quick orders to a few of his officers and immediately rushed to his father's command tent. There he saw the body of Sultan Murad with a dagger in his guts. On the ground next to the late Sultan were the mangled remains of his assassin. Murad's guards may not have been able to save their Sultan, but they were able to take their revenge. This was not a time to get overwhelmed with grief. A power struggle for the burgeoning Ottoman Empire was now brewing, but a civil war could still be avoided. Only one more man would have to die today. Bayezid quickly established control over the situation and secured the loyalty of the leading men at the camp. He then summoned his brother to their father's tent and made sure to have his own guards there, waiting for him. Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West. Today we begin our three-episode mini-series on the Crusade of Nicopolis. The Crusade of Nicopolis is a big subject, and in order to fit in everything I wanted to talk about and all the context needed to really understand it, I've decided to make this into a series where each episode will cover two chapters. Chapter 1, The Kingdom of Hungary. Chapter 2, The Ottoman Empire. Chapter 3, The Crusading Tradition in the 14th Century. Chapter 4, Preparations and the March East. Chapter 5, Nicopolis. Chapter 6, The Return Home. So, without further ado, on with the show. Chapter 1, The Kingdom of Hungary. My lords and brothers, you who, on recalling the merits of my father, have been well disposed towards me, and have not undermined the exercise of my authority, which was given to me by you. To God and to you I express my profound gratitude. You know how violent were the wars that in recent days have troubled our reign, and how many stormy dangers I have myself endured. It is by no means necessary for me to relate them to you here in your presence, or for you to hear them, for you have either seen or heard them all. Behold, then, I make a king of my betrothed, and to him I yield jurisdiction over the kingdom together with the diadem. Queen Mary of Hungary, 1386, as reported in the Chronicle of the Hungarians. For much of the 14th century, Hungary had been ruled by the Angevins. These Angevins were not the same as the kings of England, but both take their name from the same root. Angevin really just means from Anjou, and so as Henry Plantagenet started his career as the Count of Anjou, the Plantagenet kings of England thus ruled the Angevin Empire. After the Plantagenets lost most of their continental holdings, King Louis IX, also known as Saint Louis, gave Anjou to his younger brother Charles as an appanage. Charles went on to conquer the Kingdom of Naples, and so the rulers of that kingdom were thus also known as Angevins. Confusingly enough, King John II of France would grant Anjou to his second oldest son, Louis, giving rise to yet another line of Angevins, but we really don't need to worry about those Angevins here. Charles of Anjou's son, also named Charles, married Maria, a daughter of the Hungarian royal house of Arpad, and when the male line of the house of Arpad died out, Charles and Maria's young grandson, also named Charles, Charles Robert to be specific, had the best claim to the throne. He did not, however, have the only claim to the throne, and the first few years of his reign were filled with conflict. But once Charles Robert was secure on the throne, he set about re-centralizing the kingdom. Royal authority had been weakened during Charles's contest for the kingdom, but his reign would see it restored and expanded. After decades of warfare against the powerful nobles of his kingdom, Charles was able to build up the royal domain 
by seizing the castles and territories of the most rebellious lords. Furthermore, during Charles Robert's reign, gold was discovered in the kingdom. Charles's control over these mines was a major windfall for the Hungarian crown, and the revenue that he was able to draw from the mines financed his projects of centralization and also allowed for Hungary to expand and press its influence outside of its borders. In fact, during Charles Robert's reign, Hungary would account for about a third of all gold mined worldwide. During Charles's time as king, he was involved with the ever-changing alliances and conflicts with Habsburg Austria, Luxembourger Bohemia, and Piast Poland. But the most important thing for us to note here were his attempts to push Hungarian overlordship on its southern neighbors. Both Charles Robert and his son Louis made many attempts to dominate the Balkan Peninsula. Bosnia, Dalmatia, and Wallachia were all on the table as Hungary vied with Serbia and Bulgaria for dominance over the border regions. Wallachia was a semi-independent Romanian territory between Hungary and Bulgaria and was thus able to play both against each other. The voivode, or prince of Wallachia, would often transfer his loyalty to whichever party would grant him more independence. Bosnia and Dalmatia were both technically subordinated to the crown of Croatia, which was held in personal union with the crown of Hungary, but these regions were also contested. Bosnia, like Wallachia, yearned for independence and was able to play its neighbors off each other to help ensure it. Both Serbia and Hungary wanted to control it. Meanwhile, the bands, or governors of Bosnia, had their eye on expanding into Serbia. Dalmatia, on the other hand, was contested between Hungary and Venice. Venice was one of the greatest naval powers of the time, and controlled many of the islands of the eastern Mediterranean, and had contested control over Dalmatia with Hungary for years. King Louis of Hungary, also known as Louis the Great, was able to push the Venetians out of most of Dalmatia and reassert Hungarian control over the Adriatic coast. Furthermore, the mid-1300s saw both Serbia and Bulgaria begin to falter, and Louis the Great made sure to make the most of this as well. Over the course of the 1350s and 60s, Louis expanded and affirmed Hungarian control over Wallachia and Bosnia. But we shouldn't consider this to be simple annexation and conquest. The rulers of both territories still yearned for independence and were always looking to divorce themselves from Hungarian rule and overlordship. Furthermore, he was able to push into Serbia and Bulgaria proper, and either annexed or extended his suzerainty to the northwest territories of those faltering empires. Tensions between Hungary and its Balkan vassals were further exacerbated by the religious element. Hungary was a Roman Catholic kingdom, while much of the Balkans followed Eastern Orthodox Christianity, the exception being Bosnia, which had its own church considered to be heretical by both larger sects. So when Louis the Great began to incorporate the Balkan borderland territories into the Kingdom of Hungary, the political integration was followed by a wave of religious oppression. Watch this space. But Louis was not only interested in the Balkans. He was involved with numerous conflicts with his cousin, the Queen of Naples, and briefly took over the southern Italian kingdom. He also pushed east and expanded Hungarian overlordship to Moldavia, another Romanian principality. Finally, through a dynastic connection, he was able to become the King of Poland when his uncle, King Casimir III, died. Under Louis, Hungary reached its territorial zenith, but the Angevin line ended with him as he did not have any sons. A common custom in Hungary at this time was masculinization, where a daughter would be declared legally a son and given all the inheritance rights that they otherwise would not have. When he died in 1382, his lands were split between his young daughters, with Mary becoming king of Hungary and Jadwiga becoming king of Poland. Interestingly enough, although the Hungarian-Polish Union was ultimately short-lived, it did set the stage for the much longer union of Poland and Lithuania, as Jadwiga married the Grand Duke of Lithuania. Mary ruled as king in her own right for a few years, but those were fairly violent ones. The combination of her youth and her gender caused some nobles to resist her rule. Meanwhile, the Angevins of Naples decided to press their claim to Hungary against Mary, and an ironic conversion of Louis's expeditions to Italy. After five years of chaos, culminating with the imprisonment of Mary and the murder of her mother, Mary knew she needed an ally to help her rule. When she was freed from her imprisonment, she made arrangements to marry Sigismund of Luxembourg. Sigismund was a son of the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Bohemia, Charles IV, 
and the half-brother of the current king of Germany and king of Bohemia, Wenceslas IV. His betrothal to Mary was arranged when Louis the Great was still alive, but the wedding did not take place until after Mary's mother's death, likely because she saw Sigismund as a potential rival for power in Hungary. Sigismund and Mary ruled jointly until Mary's death, but from the time that the young Luxemburger prince came to Hungary onwards, he began to assert his influence over that of his wife. So while Mary is still going to be around until shortly before Nicopolis, it is now Sigismund calling the shots. Sigismund spent much of his early reign building upon the legacy of the Angevin kings. Unfortunately, much of the centralization that occurred under those kings was undone, as Sigismund had to divvy up much of the royal domain to raise support. He was a relative outsider to Hungary, and came into a position where royal authority had been seriously threatened. But all in all, Sigismund managed to create a group of powerful and mostly loyal supporters, and over time was able to restore much, if not all, of royal authority, even if he was unable to reconstitute the larger royal domain controlled by the Angevins. As David Nicol wrote, Sigismund, quote, was more like the president of a league of senior barons than an autocratic monarch. In changing the way that royal patronage was granted, Sigismund was also forced to change how the Hungarian army was constituted. Under the Angevins, the royal army was summoned by and supplied by the king, but as Sigismund had fewer resources to draw from and relatively richer vassals due to the division of the royal domain, his army resembled that more of a feudal levy. Sigismund would call on his lords to raise soldiers, and those lords would be expected to support their troops. But the right to raise your own army was limited to the lords which Sigismund trusted. Additionally, in order to keep an army in the field for longer, Sigismund would often grant subsidies to his lords when they began to complain about the cost of a campaign. When things got bad and the soldiers raised by Sigismund's allies were not enough to repel an attack, the king could still call on all the nobility of Hungary to take up arms and raise their own soldiers and flock to his banner. This force was a supplemental militia drawn from noble retainers and peasants, and the amount of men a noble was expected to supply was calculated based on the amount of peasants who lived on his land. Later in his reign, Sigismund would further reform the army, but all those reforms took place after Nicopolis and in response to it. Once his army was reorganized, King Sigismund revived the practice of regular campaigns into the Balkans, with a particular focus on Serbia. In the years after the death of Tsar Stefan Uros IV, Serbia began a process of disintegration that accelerated after the death of Tsar Stefan Uros V. The death of Stefan Uros V occurred at a bad time, happening mere months after a Serbian army was destroyed by the Ottomans at the Battle of Maritza. More on that in the next section. Authority in much of Serbia ended up being consolidated by Lazar, a Serbian prince who controlled a lot of territory in northern Serbia. As the Ottomans encroached into southern Serbia, many of the other major lords of Serbia saw Prince Lazar as the one man who could organize a solid defense and lined up behind him. Prince Lazar went on to face the Ottomans at the Battle of Kosovo, which we opened our episode with, and I will cover in more detail in the next section as well. In the aftermath of Kosovo, Lazar lay dead, as did practically all of the Serbian army. Following the battle, Lazar's son, Stefan Lazarevich, submitted to the new Sultan Bayezid, and in turn was recognized as the leader of Serbia. The combination of a Serbia without an army and the fact that the country had submitted to the Ottomans triggered Sigismund's opportunism, and he immediately began to plan a campaign into Serbia. The years between Kosovo in 1389 and Nicopolis in 1396 saw Sigismund march into Serbia many times. Sometimes he marched with only the forces of his supporters, and sometimes he mobilized the militias of southern Hungary to join him. Sigismund was able to extend Hungarian control to much of northern Serbia, and at the same time began a diplomatic offensive, hoping to woo the leaders of Wallachia and the other still independent Balkan principalities. But the aftermath of Kosovo did not see Hungary as the only power going on the offensive. The Ottomans were now on Hungary's doorstep, if only indirectly. Ottoman raids into southern Hungary became frequent, and the two powers began to compete for influence over Bulgaria, Bosnia, and Wallachia. In 1393, Sigismund was able to take Nicopolis Minor, a fort directly across the Danube from the Nicopolis, and was able to further his influence in Wallachia. This prompted Mircea, the voivode of Wallachia, to side definitively with Hungary. In response, the Ottomans campaigned into Wallachia the next year, and when they proved successful, Mircea was overthrown, and the new voivode aligned with the Ottomans. 
Eventually, Sigismund was able to restore Mircha to Wallachia, earning his further support, but it was clear that a major confrontation between Hungary and the Ottomans was brewing. Dr. Aziz Suryal Atia relates a story from around this time where Sigismund sent an embassy to the Sultan, demanding to know by what right Bayezid invaded Bulgaria, which at the time was a nominal vassal of Hungary. Quote, the Sultan received the ambassadors in a hall ornamented with Bulgarian weapons, and pointing to these, he told them, so long as he could seize such arms, he had the right, not only over Bulgaria, but also over Croatia, Dalmatia, and Hungary itself. Unfortunately for Sigismund, this signal of an increased threat came at a terrible time for him domestically. His wife Mary died in 1395, and all of a sudden, his legitimacy was seriously threatened. Sigismund remained king of Hungary despite a serious noble revolt, but now could not rely on the soldiers raised by those nobles quite as much. Sigismund had considered calling a crusade for years now, and some tentative plans had been made, but now those calls came with an increase of urgency and desperation. If the timing of Bayezid's threats to Hungary was bad for Sigismund domestically, it was great for him internationally. France and England were in the process of negotiating the Truce of Lollingham, meaning that the Hundred Years' War was on pause, and there were many knights and soldiers in Western Europe with nothing to do. But before we look at the Crusaders, we need to look at the target of the Crusade, the rising Ottoman Empire. Chapter 2. The Ottoman Empire As Osman Ghazi slept, he saw that a moon arose from the holy man's breast and came to sink in his breast. A tree then sprouted from his navel and its shade compassed the world. Beneath the shade there were mountains, and streams flowed forth from the foot of each mountain. Some people drank from these running waters, others watered gardens, while yet others caused fountains to flow. When Osman awoke, he told the story to the holy man, who said, Osman, my son, congratulations, for God has given the imperial office to you and your descendants. A story from the life of Osman, translated by Rudy Paul Lindner. The Ottoman Empire was said to begin in 1299 when Osman I became the leader of a group of Turkish nomads based in northwest Anatolia. The century between Osman's rise and Nicopolis saw incredible growth and the rapid emergence of a new world power. The rise of the Ottomans occurred in the aftermath of the dissolution of the Seljuk Empire. When the Great Turkic Empire fell apart, much of Anatolia was either claimed by the Byzantine Empire or by various other Turkic groups. The Sultanate of Rum briefly united much of Anatolia before falling to the Mongols of the Ilkhanate. But this was not a complete collapse, and the Seljuk successor princes still had their own realms, only partially subordinated to the Mongols. In his book, Between Two Worlds, The Construction of the Ottoman State, Chamal Kafadar identifies eight different overlapping and interweaving levels of authority in Turco-Muslim Anatolia. And that's without mentioning the Byzantines, the Ayyubid Rump in Anatolia, the Mamluks, or the Tatars, another group of Turkic origin that was somewhat distinct from the Turkmen who occupied most of Anatolia. So needless to say, the political scene was complicated. The territory controlled by Osman was right on the fringes of the Turco-Muslim world, and so began with looser bonds connecting it to the other levels of power, but it was still very much a part of that world. Under Osman and his son Orhan, the fledgling Ottoman state began to expand around its core territory. Here the Ottomans were mostly absorbing other Turkic beyliks or statelets and fighting with Byzantium. The early Ottoman victories over the Byzantines grew their prestige, and in turn Osman and later Orhan were able to attract more followers and further grow their influence and power. By the death of Orhan, the Ottomans controlled much of northwest Anatolia and had even gained control of the Gallipoli Peninsula, giving them a foothold into Europe. Despite the popularity, or at least former popularity, of the Gaza thesis, which states that the expansion of the Ottomans was founded on a belief of conflict and holy war with non-Muslims. It is evident that on multiple occasions, the early Ottomans allied with Christian Byzantium and other Christian entities when advantageous. Furthermore, Ottoman conflict with Islamic polities in their early years is also well attested to. Ottoman expansion rapidly accelerated under Orhan's son, Murad. Upon gaining the throne, he began a conflict with the Byzantines and was able to seize the city of Adrianople, 
one of the most important in the later Byzantine Empire, and later made it his capital, under the new name Aderna. The Ottoman presence in Aderna was a signal of intent to further expand into the Balkans and put the Ottomans on an aggressive footing. The seizure of such an important city triggered a response from both the Byzantines and the other Christian states with interests in the Balkans. But the 1360s were not a time where many of the Christian states were in a position to fight back. Bulgaria and Hungary were embroiled in a feud over the city of Vidin and its surrounding areas. Serbia was currently ruled by a weak leader, and the centralized state was in the process of collapsing. And the Byzantines, having been bled by the Ottomans for over half a century now, were too weak to do any damage on their own. The Ottomans did face some pushback, however. Early in Murad's reign, Gallipoli had been briefly occupied by some Byzantine allies, but this victory was short-lived. A more serious threat would come when some Serbian lords gathered a large army with the intention of pushing the Ottomans out of Europe altogether. The Serbian army assembled far outnumbered the forces that the Ottomans had available in Europe at the time. The goal of this campaign was to retake Adirna for the Christians, most likely for Serbia rather than Byzantium. A success would not only weaken the Ottoman position in Europe significantly, but would also strengthen the Serbian defensive position. Murad was in Anatolia at the time, so the defense of Aderna was left to one of his lieutenants. Thinking quickly, the Ottoman forces sallied out of the city in the middle of the night and conducted a night raid on the Serbian camp by the Maritza River. The Battle of Maritza was a decisive victory for the Ottomans and a disaster for the Serbs. A huge portion of the Serbian army was either killed in the battle or drowned in the river trying to escape. Meanwhile, the Ottoman position in Europe was now stronger than ever. Shortly after the Battle of Maritza, the Serbian Tsar died without an heir. Political authority in Serbia devolved to the local level, and Serbia was left without an army. The Ottoman expansion into the Balkans could now continue unhampered. The Ottomans overran much of southern Serbia, and Prince Lazar, now the most powerful independent Serbian lord, agreed to pay tribute to the Ottomans. But Ottoman expansion into the Balkans was not only focused on Serbia. Albania and Bulgaria were both soon absorbed as well. After Maritza, through a combination of conquest and diplomacy, the Ottomans were able to turn the Bulgarian Tsardom into an Ottoman province. This conquest, of course, included Nicopolis. In this, the Ottomans were actually aided by the expansionist tendencies of Hungary. Hungary and Bulgaria had been in conflict over the territory around Vidin for years, and this conflict had weakened the Bulgarian state. Furthermore, the majority Orthodox population of Bulgaria considered vassalage to the Ottomans preferable to vassalage to Catholic Hungary. As Dr. Atia wrote, quote, Submission to the Latins meant total forfeiture of their political and religious liberty. Capitulation to the Turks entailed only partial loss of political rights, but preserved in large measure their religious independence. It was therefore far more natural for the Orthodox races to offer their allegiance to Murad or Bayezid than to Louis or Sigismund. Still though, not all of the Orthodox princes were eager to submit to the Ottomans, even if it offered a good alternative to Hungary. Prince Lazar was the foremost of these. He agreed to pay tribute to the Ottomans, but valued his independence and feared future Ottoman expansion. Lazar actually benefited quite a bit from the Battle of Maritza, as he was now the most powerful lord left in Serbia. His realm became a haven for fleeing Orthodox clerics, and he accepted the vassalage of many of his neighbors. But with the fall of Bulgaria, Lazar knew that his territory was next for the Ottomans. Lazar worked out a peace agreement with Sigismund, so he could focus his attention southward. In 1386, he managed to push back an invading Ottoman army, and continued trying to push the Ottomans out of the Balkans. Lazar encouraged Murad's Bulgarian vassals to rebel, but this rebellion was ultimately fruitless. It only took the approach of the Ottoman army to make Bulgaria re-accept Ottoman overlordship. Shortly after the Bulgarian revolt, an Ottoman army in Bosnia was defeated, and Lazar was blamed for this defeat as well. And, to add insult to injury, in 1389, Lazar stopped paying tribute to the Ottomans. An example now had to be made of the prince. Lazar knew that another invasion of his territory was now inevitable, and he both reaffirmed his peace treaty with Sigismund and formed an alliance with Vuk Brankovic, the second most powerful independent Serbian lord and the ruler of Kosovo. And now we have arrived at the Battle of Kosovo. Lazar and Vuk led a combined Serbian, Bosnian, and Kosovar army against the Ottoman army led by Sultan Murad and his sons Bayezid and Yakub. This battle was no repeat of Maritza. 
This time, the Ottomans were advancing against the Serbs, and this time, the Ottomans had the numerical advantage. But, the results of the battles were similar. The Serbian army was once again destroyed, and Lazar lost his life in the fighting. But he was not the only leader to die on the plains of Kosovo. During the battle, a group of Serbian knights charged right at Murad. The Sultan's guards acted quickly and killed the knights, but not quickly enough, as one of them was able to take Murad with him into the grave. The battle was considered inconclusive, as neither army had control of the field and both sides suffered serious losses. But in the wider strategic sense, Kosovo weakened the Serbs much more than the Ottomans. When news of Murad's death made its way to the west, there was much celebrating. But this celebration was premature, as the new sultan, Bayezid, was about to prove himself every bit his father's son. In the aftermath of the Battle of Kosovo, Bayezid acted quickly to consolidate power and had his brother Yakub killed, the first recorded instance of fratricide among Ottoman princes. In the aftermath of the battle, Bayezid recognized Lazar's son, Stefan Lazarevich, as the leader of his father's Serbian territories in exchange for his vassalage. But Bayezid was not able to immediately capitalize on the aftermath of Kosovo. Upon hearing of Murad's death, many of the Anatolian territories that the late Sultan conquered took their chance to revolt. So after dealing with Stefan, with lightning speed, Bayezid returned to Asia to bring them into line. Before long, the Ottoman position in Anatolia had been stabilized, and Bayezid even took this opportunity to expand his holdings there. And in the early 1390s, the Sultan was able to focus on Europe once more. In the aftermath of the Battle of Kosovo, Hungary had begun to expand its influence into territories which Bayezid had accepted the suzerainty of. Once more, Bulgaria attempted to throw off the Ottoman yoke with Hungarian support, while an army of Sigismunds campaigned into Serbia. Bayezid took his army back into the Balkans and campaigned to re-establish Ottoman control over Bulgaria and Serbia. These campaigns were largely, if not uniformly, successful. And while the Ottoman sphere of influence was maintained, it was not done so without the occasional hiccup. Bayezid was further able to replace the Hungarian-allied voivode of Wallachia with an Ottoman client, even if this would be undone by Sigismund a few years later. In 1395, Bulgaria once more vied for independence, and this time, Bayezid responded with decisive force. When this rebellion was put down, the Sultan executed the Tsar of Bulgaria and formally annexed it. From now on, Bulgaria would be ruled by an Ottoman Pasha. The border with Hungary was not Bayezid's only concern. In his first years as Sultan, Bayezid campaigned all over his empire. I've already mentioned Anatolia, which, by the way, was a big place with multiple Ottoman frontiers, but he was also concerned with the southern Balkans and the Peloponnese, Constantinople, and the Adriatic and Eastern Mediterranean in competition with Venice and Genoa. For his relentless marches and ability to be on the scene in no time, Bayezid earned the cognomen Yildirim, or the Thunderbolt. But what of the army that marched with Bayezid? The Ottoman army, much like the Ottoman state, was still in the process of forming. Bayezid's army was based on something called the Tamar system. In the Tamar system, Tamarlis held land as grants from the Ottoman sultan, and in return were expected to provide soldiers to the sultan when in need. Despite the commonalities on the land-for-service front, this differed from Western feudalism in a few ways. While the Tamarlis were expected to obey the Ottoman governors of the larger political units, whether pashas or beys, they did not owe homage or fealty to them. And rather than the pasha or bey having rights over their territories, they were Ottoman functionaries who could be reassigned or removed at the whim of the sultan, at least at this point. When the sultan called upon the Tamarlis, the entire army marched under his banner and not those of his pashas. Furthermore, many European feudal levies had restrictions on length of service and where the campaigning would be happening. In the Tamar system, the levies were expected to campaign until they were no longer needed. The Tamarlis were further incentivized to fight hard for the Sultan, as victory meant more land for them to control. But the Ottoman army was not only one of levies. There was a more professional element to it as well, which included a cavalry element known as Sapahis and an infantry one, the famous Janissaries. At this point in Ottoman history, Janissaries did not make up a large portion of the army, being significantly outnumbered by the Sipahis and dwarfed by the Timar levies. But they were a lethal fighting force, and as the empire expanded, so would the size and importance of the Janissaries. The Ottoman military was in the process of turning from one based on nomadic horsemen into a largely professional fighting force, and we can see one phase of the transition in Bayezid's army. Similarly, the Ottoman governing apparatus was also in the process of a transition. 
the Beyluk-based governing system of Osman and Orhan was being supplemented by a more settled government. In Osman's day, the Ottomans did not control any major cities, but with expansion came the governing tools of settled society. The Ottoman state adapted elements from the Byzantines, Persians, and even from the earlier Seljuk Sultanate. And speaking of sultanates, I would like to mention that Osman and Orhan were technically emirs rather than sultans, and it was either Murad or Bayezid who first claimed that superior title. And so while Bayezid the Thunderbolt set out to prove his worthiness of the title sultan by trying to take Constantinople, calls were going out from the Hungarian court for a crusade to push the Ottomans out of Europe altogether. Next time, we're going to return to Western Europe to explore the crusading tradition in the 14th century and begin our journey from Burgundy to the Danube. Thanks so much to Veronica Fortune from the past podcast and Roberto Toro from A History of Suckart Velo, Georgia and Czar Power for reading quotes for this episode. Thank you to my patrons, Christine, Comte de Chenonceau, Elliot, Graf von Gravenstein, Anthony, Comte de chateauneuf en and James, Graf von Temsa, and to my Knights of the Duchy. And thank you for listening. If you like this episode, you can support me on patreon.com slash Burgundy. But really, the best way to support the show is by telling people about it and reviewing it on your podcast app of choice. I want as many people as possible to hear about the stories of Valois Burgundy, and spreading the word about this show is the best way to help it grow. If you want to keep up with the show, you can find me on twitter.com at Valois Burgundy. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you so much for listening.